Hello, everybody, and welcome to Play Cards Forever Wild, a TV show dedicated to the Play Card Environmental Education Center. The topic of our discussion today will be the history of Play Card, and with us uh, as a special guest, we have Mr. James P. Blanton of Blanton's Building Supply in Loris, South Carolina. Mr. Blanton, would you please tell us a little bit about the history of Play Card Center, how it was started? It just was a burning desire to see something like this done here that the younger children could learn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there was always a void there about the children having a hands-on experience with things that I thought was needed to reach the goals in education. And this uh, center was started in 1986, I believe? Yeah, it started in 86. Okay. And who started the center? How many people came together to form the center's base? Well, actually, I first uh, created the O'Ree County Conservation Foundation, mm -hmm. and I selected one person from each township. We have 11 townships in O'Ree County, mm -hmm. and I selected w one person with the help of uh, Robert Squires, who was a soil conservationist at that time, and I tried to mm -hmm. call him before I came over here today to see if he could brief me on a few things. Oh, you're going to get a little bit of <laughs> get a little up bit of update from him because <laughs> he was very helpful with me to put together the the educational plan where we would uh, would use the the uh, school system and the mm -hmm. colleges and the tech centers. He was very helpful in 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 and gave a lot of good ideas about. Uh, how we would go about that. Of course, uh, Alex Johnson, who followed him, uh, then has been very helpful to mm -hmm. see that things went on like we planned earlier. Excellent. You know, genius is 99%, what do they say, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, so it's more <laughs> work than it is. Uh, you can go anywhere you want to in life if you work hard enough at it. That's Winston Churchill, his greatest yeah. quote from uh, World War II era. And that, that's, that is really probably the motto that I've always had with education, and I think a lot of people do within our district, too. Uh, and that's hopefully the ethic that you definitely take, and, and, uh, because I know you started so many different programs for the people of this county and the surrounding counties that they've all benefited from so greatly. I, I started the Ori County Foundation by myself, Mm -hmm. And you know where I, you know where I drew it out. <laughs> I met you, Robert Squires, a while ago. Uh -huh. He was saw a Weaver a meeting in in Columbia, statewide meeting, and we had a good conference up there. And uh, uh, that night I couldn't sleep because of the ideas that hardly came to me. And that's where I created the O'Ree County Conservation Foundation. And I drew it out what I was going to do on a neck and in the uh, in the hotel in Columbia. And when Robert Squires came down, I showed it to him. No kidding. And, uh, so this place started and, on a neck. It started on a neck. <laughs> <laughs> really in Columbia. And Robert That's Robert okay. thought it was a unique idea that I had come up with. And right. he backed me. He was the soil conservationist, like like Johnson is now, you know. Mm -hmm. See, Johnson took his place. But uh, he thought it was a neat idea, so I came right on back and called and put the leg works on it. Fantastic. Uh. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> what a story. It, uh, this is wonderful. It, uh, this is such a special place, too. But you can't imagine what it does to me when I drive by here and see a bunch of children. Mm-hmm. Actually, you know, you just can't imagine. The whole matter of your story there, it sounds like to me, is perseverance, stick with it. And the first day I came to work here, you told me the most important thing that I've ever heard on my, in my whole life. And I think you can't succeed by yourself. You have to have a team of people together to get anything done. And you need to cooperate with many different individuals to have a, a uh, any kind of quality within your life. And cooperation is probably the, one of the biggest elements that you can learn out here at Playcard as well. Uh, and that's a good, that's a good way to put all those things: perseverance, drive, and uh, cooperation. Well, so those great. are the things that'll make 
anything work. Uh, we are sitting here in a kiosk, I believe that you mentioned earlier, that was built by Bill Witherspoon and Clemson Extension. Is that right, or Clemson uh, Land Clemson Grant? Clemson University. Mm -hmm. And the Career Center out at Finkley out here. The, mm -hmm. the, the students out there nailed it together. <laughs> so we've had all kinds of cooperation from many different schools within the district to come together to make play card what it is today. It's a foundation for teaching the natural sciences in the environment as a teaching tool. Bring the classroom into the outdoors. That is the focus of play card. And that's what we hope to do this year and many years to come. Well, Mr. Bland, thank you very much for your introduction to this program and we appreciate your help. Hello, my name is Jennifer Thompson. I'm a second year intern from Coastal Carolina University. My major is elementary education. I'm a junior, and the class I'm participating in is an environmental science class. Today I would like to tell you about our um, early American pioneer settlement. It was built in 1996 by LaVon Hux and the Horry County School Teachers uh, as part of the outreach program and to be able to use it as an educational tool out here at PlayCard. The actual cabin was built um, by, of course, splitting the logs and cutting them. That's actually a cross-cut saw that they used to build some of these things. They made the chinking from some of the mud and grasses of the earth and squished it together to make a really fine chinking material to go in between, and it helps to insulate in the wintertime from the cold drafts. Actually, the roof on it was made on a shaving block, much like that one and they could actually shave down the block of wood so it would fit flush with the other ones on the roof and the rain would be able to pour down off. Um, I can show you a little bit about some of these tools. Well, going back to one other thing about the cabin, we have our actual glass window up here, which is not authentic, but they used greased paper over their windows to let in some light but to keep out the mosquitoes and bugs and things like that. But actually, whenever glass became available, they went back and replaced the paper with the glass windows. So, And if you can notice back there is our chimney. And we do have fires in it, especially at our special events. This is utilized most often during our special events, like Swamp Fest and Baby Animal Day. Um, one thing I'd like to show you about is some of the tools that we have out here. Like I talked about earlier, this is the shaving block. And this was used to shave the wood down so it would be flush like on the roof and other parts of the cabin like that. And you would just shave it with the tool like this one right here. Another tool that was used in building was the cross cut saw. And actually, we could have somebody demonstrate this. Um, you would actually take the piece of wood and run it across this beam right here, and then in pioneer times, it usually would be two men. Women didn't do much of the physical labor and saw the piece of wood, which was very effective. Yep. Good job, guys. This is actually a plow that was either hooked up to a horse or a donkey so they could till up the earth and plant the seeds of their vegetables and their herbs that they used in their everyday cooking and living. Also, we have a corn husk broom, which was used, of course, to clean the floors of the cabin. Our early American settlement is still a work in progress. It was only built in 1996. We're um, trying to have efforts to furnish the inside and get some of the tools that they used and we're trying to solicit volunteer help on that and hopefully we'll be able to use this more in the future. Thank you. Okay, my name is Cameron Lepley. I'm an intern here at uh, Play Card um, from Coastal Carolina University, uh, just like uh, the other intern, Jen, and I'm getting credit for an environmental science course out here at the moment. Uh, I've already completed one internship. This is my second year. Um, so far my time out here at Play Card has been very enjoyable. And this right here is our Native American teepee village. Um, the teepees are actually the product of an idea by uh, Ronnie Floyd. He, he's the one that started this Native American program out here. He, um, he had the teepees brought in. He sets, he sets them up. He also maintains them. And he knows a lot about the weaponry that Native Americans used and a lot about the other tools that they used. Um, but first, I'd like to talk about the teepee. 
And the teepee is actually not an eastern tribal dwelling. It's more of, it's more of a western Native American Indian dwelling. And um, the idea behind the teepee is that it's very lightweight. It's easy to move around. Out on the plains of the, uh, of the west, there, there isn't much wood. So basically, what they would have to do is find whatever wood they could and make the poles for the teepee out of, those, out of that wood. And then the actual teepee fabric itself used to be made out of buffalo skins or deer skins. But these days, we make it out of canvas because that's a lot cheaper than getting buffalo skin or deer skin. Um, <clears throat> also, the, the teepee, like I said before, it was made very light so that I can be moved easily because these Indians were not stationary. They, they moved around a lot. Um, they usually followed food sources. They'd follow the buffalo tribes. And basically, the buffalo was their entire mainstay. That's how they lived. That's how they survived. Without buffalo, they wouldn't have existed on the plains. Um, the way the teepee's built, you have the poles, which are wrapped in the canvas right here, uh, or buffalo skin. And at the top of the teepee, we have smoke flaps. And the reason for the smoke flaps is because during the cold winters, they would always build a fire inside the teepee, right in the middle of the teepee. And they had to have a way for the smoke to escape, or else they'd all be, you know, suffocated inside the teepee. That that would be no good. So basically, the smoke flaps are, work kind of like a chimney in a house does, only we can take these poles right here and move the smoke flaps out or back in depending on where the wind's coming from. It's very important that the smoke flap is always opened up so that the open side is facing the leeward side of the tent. Meaning that if the wind was coming from this direction right here and hitting the top of the tent from this direction, this flap would have to be open this way to block the wind from pushing the smoke back down inside the tent. That was, that was how those smoke flaps worked. And they, were usually, they could also be closed up entirely, so like this, if they had to be. If it was really cold out, they could be closed up entirely. And just a little bit of smoke would escape, but it'd be better than having the wind inside the teepee, I guess. Um, we have some Native American tools over here. This tool right here was built by Bobby Jordan. He's a, he's a local man that helps us out a lot here at Play Garden. We'd like to thank him as well as Ronnie Floyd for the work they've done out here with the Native American program. And this mortar right here, the idea behind this is that the, the Native Americans could make kind of a pectin, which could be used and eaten all winter long. And it, they'd put whatever they were using to make the pectin inside the stump itself, which is hollowed out until about hit right here. It's about that deep inside. And this right here is a log that's been shaped into kind of like a pounding stick. And it's used inside the mortar like that. And that's how they pound it into a pectin. That's how they go about making that. Now, right here, we have a maul, which is basically a primitive hammer. Kind of looks like something a caveman would have. Um, this could be used to drive stakes in the ground, like this right here, because, you know, all these teepees, they have to be staked down. They can't just be set in the ground and, you know, high wind, they have to be staked in a place. So for something like that, you'd have a stake and your maul, you could put that right on the ground, pound it right into place, just like that. That's what that was used for. <clears throat> now, one of the most interesting parts of Native American life was the weapons that they used. Because for many, many, many years, Native Americans survived in North America without any kind of firearms. Um, before firearms, we had more primitive weapons. Most people, when they think of Native Americans, they think of the bow and arrow. But this right here is kind of a precursor to the bow and arrow. Um, this is called an atlatl, and it's made from a piece of river cane about three and a half feet long. Some of them were actually longer. The longer they were, the further they would go, and the more accurate they would be. But this is really good for actually hunting in the woods because it's shorter, it's easy to get through the trees with. Now, all these atlatls have removable tips. You can take them out and interchange them. Okay, if you pull the tip out, you can put another tip in there that might have two prongs on it or three prongs on it. You can use that for fishing or uh, hunting different kinds of game tip gets inserted into the into the one side of the or one end of the river cane. This right here is your throwing stick. This is actually called the atlatl. This is just a, a dart, but this is actually the atlatl right here. And this is basically just a branch that's been taken off an oak tree and it has a spur coming off it that's been sharpened and made to fit into a notch in the back of the throwing dart like that. Now as you can see there's some feathers right here on the back of this dart. The feathers are there more to actually keep the arrow going, going straight and to actually slow it down a little bit because without the feathers, this thing would go pretty far if you were to throw it 
at full speed, it would go pretty far, and you could you could lose it. And a Native American who was hunting didn't want to lose the, use the, uh, have the risk of losing their, their weapon, because that would leave them vulnerable. And it would also make for a much more difficult hunt. The way this was thrown was by inserting the stick, like shown, and like that, holding the arrow like this, then you'd actually run and go like that. And off in the woods it would go. That's how that worked right there. Now, as the Native Americans got a little bit more, um, a little bit, a little bit more involved with their ideas of how to make weapons and how to hunt small game, they came up with the blow dart gun, and that's what this is right here. I built this blow dart gun myself, actually, and um, put the feathers on it just to add a little bit of authenticity to it. And basically, this is made out of another piece of river cane. This one isn't very long. This is also for hunting small game in a tight. Uh, dense forest, you can make a much longer one that would actually produce a much longer shot with a dart. Um, basically the way it works is by taking one of these darts right here, and these darts were made by Ronnie Floyd, um, the same guy who did the teepees, made by Ronnie Floyd, and these are made out of cattails and thistle wrapped around the end. And the thistle is used kind of like a wadding inside inside the gun and it basically lets your air build up pressure inside the gun and the more pressure you have the faster the dart's going to go so the wadding around the end right here is very very important that's what helps produce all the pressure to, keep, to get this thing motivated now I'll demonstrate this really quickly too <clears throat> yeah sometimes it's hard to figure out which end is which this right here is the mouthpiece that I carved out on here the arrow goes in through the mouthpiece like that, and you fire it off like that. Now, <clears throat> the reason that the Native Americans would use something like this was not for hunting something like a deer or a bear or something like that. That animal would be much too large for this. If they were going to go after something like that, they'd have to hit the eye or something vital like that with this type of a weapon. But it usually wasn't very good for that. It wasn't, it wasn't very efficient for taking down big game. It was good for killing small, small game, such as small birds on the ground, um, you could use it for killing squirrels or chipmunks, anything like that. And also, generally is used by younger uh, Native Americans. The older, older men would most likely go out after bigger game with a bow or uh, with the owl owl, like I, like I showed you earlier. Um, that's about all we have here today as far as Native American stuff goes. But like I said, we have a, this, this is also kind of a work in progress for us. And when we have students out here, we do like to show them what people used to do in North America to survive before before it was settled, you know, and uh, basically how the original inhabitants of North America lived. Okay. Hi, I'm Wendy Herring. I'm from Ori Georgetown Tech. Um, I'm an intern out here. I'm in forestry management at Ori Georgetown, and I come out here for the summer for my intern. And I'm here to tell you about what we used the swamp for. We had the kids come out with a little kit, and we have them sample water, we have them sample soils around here, and I'm going to give you some examples of how we sample this water. Right here is our sucky dish, dish, yeah, which is used to measure the <laughs> the depth of the water. And you just stick it in the water, and you see how far it goes down. And when you can't see it, that's the clarity of the water. You pull it back up, and it's how far up it's wet is what you can measure the depth of how you clear the water is. Yeah. And also we have our basic net. You have the kids go in and they scoop up, they stick it in and go to the bottom. And they scoop up what they can find, which you find a lot of the green algae and little fishies are in here also. There's actually a little fish right here. So, a little mosquito fish. You can get those, you can get um, dragonfly larvae, larvae, I don't know how to say that word whatever and that lets you know that is there a clean e is it ecosystem clean ecosystem here ready okay this is our li other little container that's in our little kits for the kids to take out it has the grids one inch grid that way you, when, whatever you collect you can measure their size right now we have little mosquito fish in here also we have a water scorpion which is eating one of our um, dragonfly nymphs 
Welcome to the grist mill section of Playcard. This is where Playcard got its name. At the grist mill, where they used to grind corn and oats and wheat into flours and millet that they could eat in the surrounding community, the uh, people used to come and they used to play cards. And that's where Playcard gets its name. And legend has it that one of the wives of the men that was illegally playing cards down here in the swamp at the grist mill came in one night after her husband lost the bet or lost the farm, so to speak. I guess it could have been literally lost the farm. Uh, she burned down the grist mill. That's where play card gets its name. As, as you can see, we're sitting on a big grist mill dam. The grist mill would sit approximately right behind us, and that's where the water would rush through back when this used to be a creek channel instead of a big beaver pond swamp system like we have now. Hello, this month's species of the month is Indian pipe. Indian pipe is actually a wildflower. It doesn't really look like a wildflower because it has almost no chlorophyll along its stem or any of its leaves. The chlorophyll is usually green in plants and transfers the light into energy that is utilized for the plant for growth. The way this plant gets its energy is from a symbiotic, mutually beneficial agreement between the roots and the fungus that live on the roots. The fungus transfer energy into the root systems and the plant uses that to grow. So it does not need any chlorophyll, therefore you see only white growing up. Looks more like a fungus if you see it in, the, in your backyard or in the woods. Uh, it grows along this area from it flowers between June and October every year. That's Indian pipe. Really a neat plant. The Native Americans used to use this plant to, uh, as an eye wash and extract from this plant is an eye wash. That's one of the uses of it, and doctors used to use it as a sedative as well. Indian pipe, really a neat plant. We'd like to thank you for watching Forever Wild. We're going to be bringing a monthly TV series to you showing all kinds of aspects of environmental education within the Horry County School System. This is a fantastic intro to that series. We hope you enjoyed it, and we want you to come back for our next series. Where we're going to have many different guest speakers, and we're going to try to do some more programs for your delight. Thank you very much.